How are you today? I'm good, and thank you very much for having me on your show. You are the leader of the BBC Symphony Orchestra since 1992. Yes, that's right. You... Can you tell me a little bit about uh, how your musical journey began? I understand you play the violin and the piano. Yes, that, that's correct. I started the violin when I was uh, six years old and the piano when I was five years old. Right. Uh, my parents weren't musical at all. But my sister and I really wanted to learn the piano. And so eventually, after a lot of pressurizing my parents, they bought us a small upright piano and we had piano lessons. The violin came about because at our school that we both went to, they were offering music lessons. And my sister was already starting to learn the cello. I, I loved the cello. I loved the sound of it. And I really wanted to learn to play it. But my mum felt that two cellos in the house would be kind of too bulky. So she said I would have to learn the violin in, instead. So I, I took up the violin. Did you have exposure to any other instrument besides these two? No, I mean, it's just violin and piano. And to be honest, I find it hard enough to kind of be good on those. So I just stick to those. I don't try other instruments as well. Great. You and your sister would have uh, passed all the exhibited examinations and uh, given a lot of concerts. Yes, I got a music scholarship to my secondary school, which was a, a school called Trinity School of John Gift, which is in Croydon. Mm -hmm. I had a very good education there, but also, more importantly, a very good musical education. And then from there, I went on to the, the usual kind of route uh, to music college, left music college and kind of went straight into the profession. Right. Now, for those, what is your main role and responsibility as a concert master? Concert master or leader, which is exactly the same thing, sits at the head of the first violin section just to the left of the conductor. Mm -hmm. And leaders have a lot of different roles and responsibilities. They have to play the violin solos in the music. They have to bow and prepare the music before the rehearsal. They have to tune the orchestra with the assistance of the principal oboe. They are responsible for discipline in the orchestra. They, they recruit new members. I think the main role is acting as a link or a conduit between the conductor and the orchestra. And this works in two ways. The first way is just by dialogue, simply by, by talking. The second way is more complicated, and this involves the leader interpreting the gestures of the conductor and turning that into physical movement so that the rest of the orchestra can see. And it's kind of like a, a sort of visual aid reference point, if you like. It must always be a, a great responsibility on the shoulders of the, the concert master. In fact, you act like a liaison between uh, the conductor, the audience, and you know, between the three, right? Yes. It's, it's very important to maintain that uh, relationship. And as you say, there are, the non-verbal communication plays a very important part during your concerts on stage, right, while it's, the performance is happening. Yes, the communication between uh, leader, concert master and conductor is incredibly important to have that. You're, you're there to help the conductor, not hinder the conductor. So egos have to be left at home. Uh, and the whole process of uh, an orchestra and a conductor producing music is is or should be a collaborative one. So everybody is there, the whole orchestra is there to achieve the best possible musical result. I read somewhere for the press and publicity for the orchestra, they contact the concert master for all the press and publicity. I don't, I don't think the concert master necessarily plays a part in press and publicity, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I think nowadays, I think it's important full stop to have, for all musicians to have connection with social media particularly in the current climate of COVID-19, etc. It is a role which, it, it's not necessarily a defined role, but it's certainly one that for a concert master makes sense to pursue. You know, you want to let people know about your orchestra, about how good it is, what it's doing. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, what is music to you? Music is kind of, I, I suppose my life is pretty much consumed by music and has been since I was about 11 or 12, which is when I decided that that's what I wanted to do. It's not a career, it's a vocation, really. If I wanted to earn lots of money, I, I definitely wouldn't have become a musician. So most of the time I'm either playing or listening to music or 
thinking about it. And as a musician and a violinist, you're you're always trying to improve and you're always learning new things. So you're essentially a, a student forever, really. Also, for, for me, music is kind of quite therapeutic as well. I find it quite hard to relax as a person. I'm quite obsessive and quite compulsive. And so to music and playing music, I, I actually find quite calming. So that is also a very positive thing for me. Yeah, really as a musician, I always feel that one of the best forms where we can express. Yeah. Yeah, the music actually disciplines you, right? Because yeah, it gives you discipline, focus. What would be your message to the, the younger generation, especially for people, young, young people who would wish to pursue the career in music? Yeah, I think I would say only do music performance if you are compelled to do it so you can't possibly contemplate doing anything else and that's because like we were saying before it's it's not a career it's a vocation mm. so it's really important that you're you're absolutely committed to it i think because it's a vocation the highs are very high and the lows are are pretty low <laughs> um so you've got to be determined You've got to be focused and you've got to be mentally tough. It doesn't matter how good you are, you will be criticised and you will have criticism. So, and that's not easy to, to cope with. But if you do it properly and you do it with integrity, then I think it's a really highly satisfying and stimulating uh, work in life to have. Yeah, I'm sure because, uh, see, when you look back, 10, 20 years back, um, you know, music was not something what that is seen today. Yeah. Things have, things have changed, priorities have changed, perspectives have changed about music. And what music was 20 years ago, uh, in terms of uh, the progress with the advancement in uh, technology, one can explore several opportunities. But what you said is true. If you don't have the right kind of mindset and the time, the commitment uh, and dedication, and if you do that with uh, full integrity, uh, it can be successful. Absolutely. If you're, if you're completely committed to it, and you're determined, then you, you will be successful, definitely. Especially with uh, the youngsters uh, right now, uh, getting into that foray of uh, you know taking music as a full-time profession they should also understand you know what what is really required to be a successful musician in the long term they need to have develop uh, you know let go of the sensitivity and uh, you know take criticisms as a constructive feedback as far as criticism goes it, it's difficult because if you're doing something that you really love mm -hmm. then any criticism feels like it, it does feel like a personal attack almost and and so that that's what's difficult about it you need to be thick-skinned but at the same time you can't be too thick-skinned because then you would lack sensitivity to to be a musician so it, it, it's difficult there is a fine balance one needs to develop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Performing, I'm sure, is uh, really quite thrilling for you know many of us. What is your most exciting uh, performing experience? I, I knew you were going to ask this question, so I have given it quite a lot of thought. I've been around for quite a long time, so I've done a lot of concerts over the years. I've done orchestral concerts, uh, chamber music concerts, concerto performances, but I find it really difficult to actually come up with my most exciting performance to date. So I thought I might go off at a slight tangent, mm -hmm. if, if I may. And what, what I would say is that sometimes when you are performing a piece of music that you really love uh, with people that know you very well musically and you know them very well musically, you sometimes enter this state of mind where you don't have to think really about what you're doing anymore um, or what other people are doing. And everything just seems to happen on its own. And it's almost like you enter... You, you kind of exit, I should say, your your body and you're kind of looking from a distance away at what is happening. And that doesn't, it doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, I would say that it's an amazing kind of experience. And in, that's, so that would be my most exciting performance experience where whenever that happens. That's so true. When we get completely engrossed yeah. Uh, a performance, uh, we think that uh, we are not physically present there. Yeah. Right? It sounds all so very magical. And once the performance is over, one would think, how did that happen really? Yeah. With your vast experience, I can completely understand it's difficult for you to pretty much uh, pin down on any one instance as such. 
Yes, no, no, absolutely. Mm, as a concert master and leader of the BBC uh, Symphony Orchestra since 1992, I'm sure over the years you would have uh, had to overcome several challenges, right? It, it would have not been so very easy and smooth as one would always think. So, how did you, how did you overcome, uh, or what rather made you overcome all these challenges and reach a state where you are today? I think I've always been very determined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been, I, I mean, there have been difficulties over those years. I'd say not so much musical difficulties, but I found out about 10 or 12 years ago that I had quite severe obsessive compulsive disorder. And I had a bit of a sort of kind of like a break, a breakdown about 12 years ago when I just couldn't do anything at all. And in fact, I contemplated stopping playing the violin and doing something completely different because I didn't want to do it anymore. Because I think because the music had always been the place that I went to when I probably felt the OCD was getting bad. And when the music didn't work anymore for that, I kind of, I thought, well, I may as well not carry on doing it. But to cut a long story short, I, I got better. Whenever anything like that happens, something pretty major, I, I think you... You do get through it. You do you do recover from it. You you learn stuff from it, and I think you. It's not a very original thing to say, but I think you appreciate what you have even more. So the fact that I went back to playing after that, when I thought probably I wouldn't be playing again, just made me appreciate how what a great thing it was to, to be able to do. So those those kind of things, I think if you can get through them, then I think you learn more from those than you do from all the the successful stuff, really. Amazing. Well, here today as the leader of the orchestra, when you were growing up, you also had an opportunity to learn both violin as well as the piano. I would want to go into this direction. Did you have that kind of a, a thought at some point? I think when I was, I, it was as early as when I was 11 or 12 that hmm. I, I decided that's what I wanted to do. And I think it was influenced very much by going to a new violin professor right. who played me before every lesson. He used to play, play me recordings of great violinists, which I hadn't really, up until that point, I'd never heard before. So I used to listen to Yasha Heifetz, to Pablo Casals on the cello, Nathan Milstein, violinist, just like the, the best, the absolute best musicians ever, really. That was what inspired me. I genuinely believed at that point that one day I would be able to play exactly like that. Unfortunately, I haven't reached those heights yet. But I mean, so that was the motivation. I thought, wow, that's incredible. This is what I want to do. Perhaps you were blessed with a, a good teacher. Who yeah. Could actually, uh, you know, guide you through very well and bring uh, interest in the, whatever uh, instrument you were learning. You said violin. In fact, I have uh, had the uh, opportunity to listen to a few of your uh, uh, orchestral performances. And uh, my favorite, my daughter is a bassoonist. She's a principal bassoonist for the Birmingham Orchestra. She used to be, and now she's at the university. So, okay. so my particular favorite, and I've always been uh, uh, impressed with uh, bassoon playing, especially uh, my daughter's uh, playing uh, attending her concerts. So I enjoyed uh, Rimsky's uh, Corsicos, you know, especially the, the bassoon part, which <laughs> I was really so very interested. Sorry, I was. I was too biased with uh, bassoon, but overall it was, uh, it, was a, it was a brilliant orchestra and uh, performance. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, interesting. You are truly an accomplished uh, individual and you have definitely made your mark in the Western music world. Thank you. Have you ever thought about uh, collaborating with musicians from other cultures? It could be a challenge, right? Especially when we are not exposed to... Have you had any kind of uh, experience where uh, you have actually collaborated with outside the Western uh, music world? I haven't really collaborated with people from other cultures I, I have collaborated with performers from other areas mm -hmm. so you know actors pop singers even would you believe uh, rappers on one occasion okay. yeah. Uh, yeah and it, it was interesting and I don't know for me to see how good they were and what they did they, they were great performers as far as collaborating with musicians from other cu cultures such as Eastern music, I haven't at all. But if the opportunity arose, I would definitely take it because, you, you know, it would be really interesting and you can learn things. Yes, I'm very keen to you know, collaborate with you probably in the coming uh, projects and see how best we can work together. And yeah. It would be uh, very interesting how we can uh, take the commonalities uh, from each uh, you know, between uh, the Western music and the Carnatic music. Yeah. And also the 
same time show the uniqueness. And this is why the British Carnatic Choir was launched in the UK. So this was my purpose to, to collaborate and encourage people from other cultures, other genre of music to, you know, experiment with this style of music. In Carnatic music, we have certain ragas which have a very therapeutic effect on our mind. I mean, it's just something very similar in uh, Western music. I think it's generally acknowledged that listening to Western classical music, particularly, I think, early-ish classical composers, can relieve anxiety and stress. I think there's been a number of studies to prove that. There's also, of course, as, as I think you would know a lot better than me, um, music, music therapy, where music is used to treat people with dementia and mental illness. And actually, I have firsthand knowledge of, of that because my dad had dementia. And one of the best ways of getting him to be less anxious was for us as a family to sing old songs with him. Difference between how he was before we started to sing it and how he was after was incredible. So I can see the, you know, the, the power of those, those therapies. Amazing very true. Now, having worked with, again, people with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's uh, using Carnatic music, there is a lot of positive effect on the mind. So music as such, whether it is uh, whichever genre, whether classical or whichever uh, culture we come from, I think it has a very, very healing or soothing effect. Personally, you have uh, tried this uh, and uh, you found out the amazing effect of uh, you know, the music. That's very good. Some of the schools do not have music as part of their curriculum. Mm. That's that's quite interesting uh, because I feel music should be, uh, you know, included in every uh, academic curriculum in every school, especially the young, uh, in the primary schools. Uh, they should definitely have this as a part of their uh, curriculum. What are your thoughts about this? I mean, I think it's it's pretty depressing, actually when schools don't have music on their curriculum. And I don't understand it because it, it is, again, I think it's it's accepted nowadays that musical training develops a large number of other skills, such as um, increased brain development, apparently, um, better social skills, discipline. So it, it would make sense to do it just simply for that. And I'm sure you must be having younger members also, right? From what age do you start taking them as part of... I think the youngest probably you're, you're going to come across is maybe 20, 21. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So it won't be, it definitely won't be any younger than that because you you have to have a, a full kind of musical training at a music college, at a university in order to come into that environment, really. Right. Okay. We have educational... Um, th things where we we have something called side by side, which is where the professional players sit next to the younger players, and you know they play, they do a rehearsal together, or they play a a, a concert, and that's um, that's very successful. A, a lot of orchestras do that. Okay, by the BBC. Or yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the BBC has a very a pretty extensive educational set up actually. See, COVID-19 has uh, negatively impacted. The virus is still spiraling. Yeah. See, how about, uh, for uh, musicians, uh, for artists uh, and the entertainment industry, it has greatly affected, isn't it? Yeah. How do you see this uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 and uh, despite all oddities, how do you think you can uh, make this uh, or turn it around in a much positive way with the new format? which is online. Like everyone else, COVID-19 has impacted my life in a big way. I was working out in the last six months, I've done one concert and I've had, I think it's something like 40 concerts have been cancelled. So it's had, a, it's had a huge effect. I'm in a much better position than a lot of musicians, uh, particularly freelance players who are not getting any work at all. So it's it's a grim, it is a really grim situation for the arts, for musicians. I'm trying to be positive that it will change. I think in the meantime, the only thing one can do is try and look after the people who are really struggling. And also, I suppose, try and get something positive out of it, out of the situation. So, I mean, it's only a, in a very small way, but I've been trying to get to grips with social media, with Zoom calls, with making videos, 
and and just trying to adapt to a completely different situation. I th- I think that's what most people are doing as well. Well, we we were now got used to the uh, the virtual platform, and as you said rightly, we as artists uh, can do in a in our own very small way to help other artists. Yeah. Uh, but i'm sure uh, this virtual platform will still continue for uh, a few more years what is the thing about uh, bruce lee and you just bruce lee is somebody i really admire mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily because of what he did because I, it's not a subject i know a huge amount about um, martial arts but i admire him because he uh, made himself to be as successful as he possibly could be. He, he kind of pushed himself to the limits of, uh, you know, improving his physique, improving his skills. And I, I really admire that. So that's that's my uh, that's why I, I kind of admire him. And I occasionally mention him in interviews and that kind of stuff. Right. Perhaps the kind of mindset he had, uh, you can use it in any form of uh, career, whatever you're doing, right? So makes sense, perfect sense. So do you prefer performing as a soloist or as part of an orchestra? I genuinely like both. So I love, yeah, I love playing solo stuff. I love leading orchestras. I love playing chamber music. stubborn, generous, and kind of introverted. Best piece of advice you have ever received? Oh, that's easy. From my mum when I was about 12 years old. And I, I have to just explain how the advice came about, otherwise it doesn't make much sense. But I had just done a concert. Um, I was I was obviously quite a young, I was 12 years old, but I was also very small for my age as well. And I just played the violin and as happens in those situations, any any of the ladies who were of a, an elderly age in the audience, they all think somebody that looks really young coming to play the violin is fantastic. So it had gone well. Um, and I walked off the stage and I said to my mum, that went really well. And she said, well done. Uh, and I said, yeah, and I didn't even practice. And she's expecting her to say, what a clever boy you are. But to my surprise, she said, actually, that's not good. You, you must always work. Uh, you were lucky to get away with it. You must always work. And then if you really work and you put in every effort, then it doesn't matter after that how it goes. It doesn't matter whether, whether it's successful or not, as long as you put the application and the, the hard work into it. And, and that was the best bit of, 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 of advice he easily Favorite food? I like really basic things. So I would say fried egg and chips is my favorite meal. Your dream vacation? Uh, the Seychelles or the Maldives. Which is the movie you will always watch whenever it is on the telly? Uh, probably a, a Bruce Lee one. So maybe uh, Enter the Dragon. I should have expected that. What did you dream of being as a kid? Up until a certain point, until I was 12, I dreamed of being a footballer. And after 12, I dreamed of being kind of a highly successful violinist. Which you have, yeah. Well, to a degree. What is success to you? I think meeting my own expectations, which I must confess I don't do very often. But that would that would be true success. It's not. It's not so much what other people think it's it's kind of how I feel about it and and if I feel that I've done a really good job so that that would be my definition of success Thank you, and and thank you very much for having me, and I've really enjoyed it, so thank you.